Um, so offer now it's, in, it's your turn to uh, to present. I'll let you yes. do. Thanks. Merci, Milene. Um, bonjour. And with your permission, I will now switch to uh, English as I covered my entire French vocabulary. So um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to introduce uh, Clue ICU, the Clue ICU platform and Clue company uh, uh, in general. Um, I think that uh, as a clinician, I've always wanted to have the ability to look into the future, to understand what is about to happen with my patient. Uh, and I think that we're in a very interesting point in time in which for the first time we do have a crystal ball to look into the future with the assistant of data and to be more specific, data science tools, mostly machine learning and artificial intelligence. Clue Medical, my company, of which I am a VP of clinical development, is focused on turning data into insights. We analyze the entire spectrum of clinical data arriving from the patient, whether from the EMR, from direct HL7 channels such as medications, orders, labs, uh, and from medical devices surrounding the patient, such as the ventilator and the monitor. Everything is ingested and identified, what we call mapping, by the clue system, and then it could run as values in the AI, in the artificial intelligence platform, and in the algorithms in order to provide output that can help us get insights. What about what's about to happen with the patient, what we call predictive clinical analytics, insights about optimizing the patient flow, and also some benchmark safety and quality measures. We are even prepared to add to this uh, wearable devices so that in the near future, we will also be able to give the same uh, um, benefit for patients at home because we understand that we're about to enter the age of hospital at home. Just to get everyone on board about what machine learning is, specifically in supervised machine learning, which is the uh, most common way or method of machine learning, we focus on a specific outcome. Let's say, for example, uh, an outcome of uh, uh, mechanical ventilation. The outcome that we want to predict should be very focused and easily identified. It cannot have any ambiguity, ambiguity because we train the model to identify which variables predict this outcome to happen. Let's take, for example, several uh, variables such as the um, SpO2, the respiratory rate, and we understand that they all relate to the outcome of mechanical ventilation, but each of those receives a different weight in the formula. Some are more important, some are less important. Machine learning looks at big data so that we run at thousands and tens of, tens of thousands of patients and realize what formula best predicts the same outcome in all those patients. This is what is called supervised machine learning. In our case, we trained models to predict two very important uh, outcomes in the ICU settings. One model predicts respiratory failure in a time period of the next eight hours to be more specific, we trained our model and our algorithms to predict that within the next eight hours, the patient will need intubation and the start of mechanical ventilation. This was our definition for respiratory failure. The second model predicts hemodynamic instability, again, in the next eight hours. And again, to be more specific, the outcome is defined as the initiation, the start of any vasopressor medication. So these are the, our two deterioration models. And as I said, they give a window of prediction of eight hours forward. We also have a third model, which is independent and predicts that in the next eight hours, no significant deterioration is going to happen to the patient. Or in other words, it's a third model that predicts stable patients. No important event is going to happen for the patient in the next eight hours. 
In order to create these three models, we have looked at the data set of almost 80,000 ICU stays that cover 11 years in a huge data set coming from an ICU network, tele-ICU network in the United States, which includes several, several sub-specialties of ICU so that we have a full coverage of patients such as medical ICU, uh, surgical ICU, cardiac, uh, cardiothoracic, et cetera. Uh, this gives us a very wide variety of patients so that we believe that the models are very valid to give the same predictions of deterioration or stability to almost any ICU patients. I will just focus and uh, emphasize this is only for adult ICUs, meaning only adult patients over the age of 18. There are three stages in creating a machine learning model. The first one is training the model, as I said earlier, defining the outcomes, and then running the models or the algorithms on a huge data set of patients so that they understand what values to give to each, each of the components and what, what weights and create a formula that predicts that outcome. The second phase is the testing set. You take from within the same data set a different group of patients, and then you test that your model really predicts what is about to happen to them. But the most important part after you created your model is the validation. And this is also what is required by the regulatory, um, both in the United States by the FDA and in Europe by the CE. You need to have validation studies. And we created validation for several groups. The first two groups of validation were validation cohorts from the same data set on which we trained and tested the model, but different patients. We set aside from the beginning thousands of patients from the same hospital network from within those 80,000 stays. We did not look at them. We did not train the model of them. We've never seen them. And then we run the models on them to identify the performance of the model on patients that were never seen before. Afterwards, we, we did a second validation study on a cohort of thousands of patients arriving from a different hospital network in another state, which means different demographics, different population, uh, to validate that the model works in a different hospital. Usually in all those cases, when you move from the training set, from the data set on which you trained to a different place, to a different location, there is also a draw, always a drop in performance because many things are different, not just the patients, such as the work routines, uh, the EMR. And we managed to, say, to show that we kept almost the same performance, which was very uh, satisfying for us. But then a real question came up. Because we trained the model on 10 years, 11 years of data in which there was not even one single COVID-19 patient because it was before the development of the COVID-19 uh, era, we were wondering how robust is our model? As I said, it was trained on a huge data set of patients that include many different types of patients from different ICU subspecialties, but there were no COVID patients there. Therefore, we took another cohort of more than 500 patients from different hospitals, different states in the US, all of them COVID-19 patients, and we validated that our models, which were not trained on COVID, perform at the same uh, performance on COVID-19 patients. And as you can see in our results here, the two uh, models performed very satisfyingly on all the cohorts. What you see on the left is the respiratory failure model, the prediction of uh, intubation and mechanical ventilation in the next eight hours. And on the right, the hemodynamic instability model, predicting uh, the initiation of vasopressor medications within the next eight hours. Uh, for those of, of you who are not uh, accustomed to watching this type of graphs, this is what we call AUC or ROC curves, which balance 
the, the two important uh, uh, values of sensitivity and specificity, because there is always a trade-off between them. If you are very sensitive, you lose specificity and vice versa. And what you, what you hope to achieve is a graph that goes as far as possible from this diagonal line. The diagonal line means we have no idea. It's just a 50-50 chance as if I'm flipping a coin. And you can see in the models, both of them receive an AUC, an area under the curve of almost 0.9 for all the populations, both for the populations in UMass, those are the populations where we created the model. So there are two validation cohorts there, but even considering the drop in performance, when we move to a different hospital, it is still around 0.9, it falls to 0.86, and the same is true for the COVID-19, okay, in both models. The COVID-19 is the blue uh, graph here. What is interesting is that we found that not only do our models keep their performance on COVID-19 patients, it's even a little bit better than in the general population. And we were wondering about it because this was a good surprise. And the reason is that the uh, frequency of the events, frequency of the deteriorations in COVID-19 patients was significantly higher. There is simply more events, more opportunities for the model to identify. And because of that, the performance in what we call real patient, real deteriorating patients is even better than in the general population that includes many elective patients, those who are staying in the ICU, uh, sometimes just for follow-up with no real critical uh, clinical indication for that. The next phase was to put these models into a product that can help clinicians, both in tele-ICU settings and in ICU settings, use the models uh, for their routine. Now, the product that we created, which is called Clue ICU, is EMR agnostic. We can work with any EMR system. It is cloud-based, meaning it is accessible from the web, of course, if you have the right authorization, but you don't need any hardware for it. You just type in or click the link and you're in the system. It supports a very customizable workflow, so it's very flexible. I will show you a little bit of that soon. And it relies on the AI predictive models that we created and I showed you earlier. This product has received both FDA clearance and CE clearance in the last several weeks. So that we're right now in the beginning of the marketing stage for the product, both in the US and in Europe. I said the system is um, the product is cloud based. You enter your username and password. This is the entry screen, and then you reach this screen, which is what we call the unit view. On the upper area, you see multiple units. It could be either units in the same hospital or in different locations in a network. As I said, in this case, in this example, this is a, a demo showing a tele ICU network. Um, the UMass Memorial in Boston, which has seven different hospitals with ICU units, and you can just move between them. But for each unit, what you see, and this is based on the three models, is a classification of the patient into three risk uh, groups. This does not mean the situation of the patient right now. This is the crystal ball that gives us a prediction of what is about to happen to the patients in the next eight hours. And we see here two patients in the high-risk area, marked in red, and these two patients are at very high probability of deteriorating, in this case, both of them, to hemodynamic instability within the next eight hours. They have not yet developed shock, but we predict that they will do it in the next eight hours. In the middle, we see moderate risk, which could be either patients that have not crossed the threshold, so the model does not predict it, 
or patients that are already treated. So we see two ventilated patients and one who is already on vasopressors. And for those patients, of course, there is no need to predict that event in the future because it already happened. And the third group of patients are the low risk patients. Those are the patients that the third model predicts will remain stable in the next eight hours and do not require, sorry, will not require any significant clinical intervention. Now, I'm sure all of you as clinicians can think immediately of the use cases of such a brand new and novel view. The first obvious uh, use case is, of course, moving and going to examine and treat those high-risk patients. Since I have an early uh, an ability to for early intervention, we hope this and we believe this will lead to better outcome. Hopefully, if I intervene early, I might prevent that outcome from happening. Perhaps if I give some IV fluid uh, bolus or identify the bleeding um, early, I might prevent the outcome of the patient developing hemodynamic shock and requiring vasopressors by the early identification of the patient, or perhaps I can prevent the intubation. But even if we do not prevent an intubation from happening, this is still very useful. And we've seen that in the COVID area, because the ability to know in advance that the patient will need, will require intubation, allows us to, go, to use safety measures for the staff, allows us to move the patient to a different location from other patient, allows us to call for a more experienced clinician to perform the intubation. So these are the obvious interventions for the high risk uh, patients, but let's think about the low risk patients. We know that in many, many events, ICU beds are full and are always in need for um, by other patients coming from the ED or from the floors. The stable patients are the most obvious ones to be ready for discharge. Now, I do not say that my model predicts everything or that they are discharge ready, but as one of the clinicians in the States who have used the system told us, he's a very experienced uh, intensivist, he told us, even if I think from my experience that this patient is discharge ready, it is still very good for me to have a small angel on my shoulder, as he called it, or an AI system saying, yes, I agree with you. Nothing is going to happen to the patient in the next eight hours. So this is very useful for looking at the most obvious choice for patient to be moved to the uh, step down unit or to the floors. But there are other use cases as well. For example, how to allocate my staff. This is the first time that I can allocate my nurses, for example, in the ICU, not just according to the number of patients, but according to their acuity and what is about to happen in the coming shift. I will, of course, prefer to use my more experienced nurses on those patients who are about to deteriorate, who I know might cause problems within the next shift. While for the less experienced nurses or nurses who are filling in and are not ICU nurses, I might uh, allocate the stable patients. I might also consider giving more than two patients per nurse if they are predicted to remain stable. So this is the first screen, but of course, this is not all we have in the product. The second screen is the patient view. The patient view allows us to focus on one specific patient, any of the patients in the system, and understand in one view almost everything that has happened to the patient in any time point throughout the stay, as well as what is about to happen. So we have an area here of the labs and clinical scores, and whatever um, um, value I hover on, I can see the trend over the last several days. Below that, I have an area with graphs, but although it looks like a monitor, it is very different from a monitor that only keeps the data for the last several minutes. I can zoom in and zoom out in time with this ruler, and if I zoom out, I can even see several weeks of data. And I'm also very flexible the about the type of data that I uh, present, because on the left you have here several menus, and you can just drag anything you want from it, add it to the graphs, remove anything you're not interested in, 
and show also the medications that the patient is receiving, for example, um, uh, the antibiotics. If I click on that in the real life version, it will open the types of antibiotics from where to where the patient receives it, the vasopressors, etc. There are many other features in the uh, system and in the platform, and I'd be happy to give for those of you who are interested uh, a full demo. And at the end of the uh, presentation, you will have the contact for that. The last thing I want to show is what we call in the work list screen, the best practices. Now, the work list screen is the screen through which you uh, focus on your all your proactive intervention. You, when you work in front of this screen, you can work proactively uh, instead of just reacting to the patients. First of all, we have here a collection of all the alerts, all the notifications in the system, all the high-risk patients, as well as an ability to add manually other high-risk patients that you want to focus on, not just by the models. But what I want to show you is the best practices over here. Best practices are simply smart lists that identify patients suiting your definitions for what you want to focus on. Let's say, for example, that one hospital wants to focus on identifying which patients that are ventilated might be ready to start the PEEP winning protocol. It means that I want to constantly look at the patients and identify when they have an SpO2 above a certain threshold with a specific FiO2 and PEEP, and if it crosses the thresholds of the criteria that you define, then that moment the patient is added to the list. Again, I do not try to say what the best practices or guidelines are. I just give you a very flexible tool for identifying patients according to what you define. This allows early identification of patients perhaps ready to start the weaning and extubation protocol. There are also, and these are just examples, best practices for identifying patients who need um, perhaps an intervention with short-term lines and catheters, perhaps the catheter or the line has been inserted a long time ago, or perhaps the patient is showing some type of infection. There are many other ideas for best practices, but mostly we're interested in receiving uh, demands and uh, ideas for best practices that we can supply within a day or two. What's next with Clue? Clue is about to look outside the ICU, and this is still in, in development, but our next phase is what we call the control tower, looking at the entire hospital, not just ICU patients, to give complete hospital situational awareness. And just uh, like air traffic control towers, what we want to do in the entire hospital is assist the throughput, assist as many patients as possible to move through the hospital at the shortest time, but without sacrificing safety and quality. Exactly like an airplane, we want to add as many planes as possible through the air uh, region without the need to add more terminals and more runways or in the hospital without the need to, more, to add more beds and more staff. This is something we're already working on. Again, this is not a ready product, but it will give what we call a three-dimension uh, situational awareness. First of all, the occupancy in the hospital, how many patients there are right now, but also a prediction of how many patients are about to be in the hospital tomorrow or in 48 hours by prediction models of both discharges and admissions. But occupancy alone does not say anything. Two units can be with the same occupancy, but very different in their complexity. In one unit, the patients are deteriorating, while in the other unit, the patients are stable. And also in the resource consumption, let's say that in one unit, all the patients are uh, bedridden and receive only IV medications, while in another unit, all the patients are independent, receive only per os medications, and need very little nursing attention. So only those three aspects together create the full three-dimensional or even four-dimensional, if we look into the future, situational awareness. All our products and all our uh, uh, models rely on some under the hood machine learning methods, which are top of the art. Basically it's clustering, anomaly detection, and as I said, supervised 
machine learning predictive models, but also semi-supervised, even going to neural networks. Thank you, everyone, and I'm happy to uh, give a full demo for anyone who's interesting. You're welcome to copy either our website or our email and request for demos, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, available. Thank you.